the Lord be with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. And because it is the weekend before the inauguration and our country is in such a state of unrest, I thought we could pray for our nation and also for social justice. And these are from the Book of Common Prayer for the nation. Lord God Almighty, you have made all the peoples of the earth for your glory to serve you in freedom and in peace. Give to the people of our country a zeal for justice and the strength of forbearance, that we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And then this is the prayer for social justice. Almighty God, who created us in your own image, grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression. And that we may reverently use our freedom, help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations to the glory of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I'm also going to pray the collect for Martin Luther King Jr., even though the church normally celebrates somebody on the anniversary of their death. The um, country celebrates Martin Luther King Jr. on the anniversary of his birth but I think it feels relevant to pray his collect anyway. So, Almighty God, by the hand of Moses, your servant, you led your people out of slavery and made them free at last. Grant that your church, following the example of your prophet, Martin Luther King, may resist oppression in the name of your love and may strive to secure for all your children the blessed liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from 1 Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make 
both ears of anyone who hears it tickle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house, from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever, for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by any sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Good morning. I'm not gonna preach a fiery Martin Luther King Jr. birthday sermon this morning. It's kind of weird to do that with a camera. But also I think this morning's Hebrew Bible lesson has a great deal to teach us about courage, about speaking the truth even when the world doesn't wanna hear it. And so I'd like to lead us gently through this story. I wanna start with some of those first just provocative sentences that we hear in the lesson that Sarah read just a minute ago. There's such a provocative line in here. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. One of the things that tells us right off the top is that even in the temple where Samuel, the little boy, who's probably eight or nine, and Eli, the old man who's a priest, that even the temple where they find themselves is a place where people are not hearing and seeing the word of God anymore. That tells us a lot about Eli. The story goes on to tell us, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see. This is a priest whose sight has literally begun to fade. He can't see God's presence in the world much anymore. The backstory that leads us to here says he's probably also lost his courage but what's one of the things that's really important about these moments, two things. Visions were not widespread. Many of my colleagues are gonna to preach today that this is actually our time, but I would disagree. Visions are really widespread right now. Everybody thinks that God is calling them to protest, to attack the Capitol, to um, claim that the vote was stolen. Just look at the signs people carried at the Capitol. There's a whole wing of Christianity right now that believes God is calling them to fight, that believes God anointed President Trump in the same way that this prophet Samuel will, will anoint King David in a couple of decades. The real question for me is not whether visions are widespread, but how do you know that a vision is from God? I would say one of the primary tests in the Bible for whether something is of God is to look at its fruits. In this case between Samuel and Eli, the fruits of the two of them recognizing that this was a call from God are enormous. Samuel becomes one of the greatest prophets of the Israelite kingdom. The last line of today's lesson, and all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. He even anoints by God telling him which of Jesse's sons to pick. He anoints David as the king. David, 
King David, Jesus' ancestor. The fruits of this moment with Samuel and Eli are clear. But what? how can we use that test of fruits in our lives now? Well, let's look at what happened at the Capitol. The people who went to the Capitol, believing that God called them there, that God called them to break into the Capitol and disrupt what was happening. Let's look at the fruits of that action. The most tragic among them is that five people died. One of them beaten to death with a fire extinguisher. Someone else, a police officer, killed himself in the days to follow. And if their actions really had been prophetic and God really had called them, looking at the fruits of it would have been to perpetuate a lie, to disenfranchise millions of voters, most of them in cities, most of them people of color, people, people whose voices have been suppressed in this country for centuries. That is not the voice of God who called God's people out of slavery into freedom. The God, the living word, Jesus, who said that one way you would know him from the prophet Isaiah is that the captives would be set free and good news would be preached to the poor. Testing the fruits. This is not the fruit of the word of God. Who benefits from the fruit that's produced? Who gets to eat and who goes hungry? That's a really simple test for whether this is really God's word. The second point I wanna make here is that the word of God isn't always easy. In fact, it is often terrifying. Samuel is given a vision that Eli's reign, Eli's family's um, priesthood is going to come to a horrible and humiliating end. He, and Samuel's just a little boy and he is in the care of Eli and he has every reason to fear that if he tells Eli this vision, Eli will put him out or kill him. At the very least, he has to be afraid that what he's going to say is going to hurt Eli deeply. This is a mark sometimes of the true word of God. It may hurt. It may hurt people who have been in power. Sometimes the truth does that. Sometimes the truth reveals to us in very plain language that which we've been hiding from ourselves, like Eli, the truth about his own ability to see and hear God, how it's been fading and drying up over the years, the shame that his sons have brought to the priesthood and to the temple and to God. These are truths that he's been avoiding for years and for Samuel to speak them from God's own lips has to burn. But there's another line in here that um, is what I'm gonna hold in my head in the days to come when I feel called to speak a truth where I've tested its fruits, I've read it in scripture, I've compared it against the words of Jesus and I'm convinced it's the word of God and I'm scared. I'm afraid people will have their feelings hurt or they might harm me in some way. But here's a little line. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him. Well, that's one thing. When the Lord is with you, it gives you more courage, but it's this line. The Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. Too often, the words we yearn to say fall to the ground. 
they slip through our fingers or we drop our hands because the weight of them is so heavy. This idea of your words slipping through your fingers or you letting let them fall to the ground is something so many of us have experienced when we're in a tense situation and we just can't find the words to speak up for ourselves or for another person. Samuel never let the words of God fall to the ground. He never let his own fear, his own lack of courage, his own lack of clarity stop him from holding those words and sharing them with others. Don't let the words of God fall to the ground. And finally, where did Samuel get this courage? As a little boy of eight or nine, how do we get our courage? I think one way, assuming we've tested the fruits from the words of scripture, from the life and ministry of Jesus, from looking at who's fed by the fruit and who goes hungry, Assuming that doesn't give us courage, where do we get our courage? From seeing how essential we are to the big picture of God. As I mentioned earlier, Samuel goes on to become one of the greatest prophets of ancient Israel. His story and the story of Saul and the great King David and David's son Solomon are so intertwined together and they are literally at the root of our faith. Samuel's yes and courage to this moment and those that follow are essential to the story of God's kingdom. But he didn't know it at the time, neither did Eli. One of the lessons in this is that words we say, words of truth, spoken at the right moment to the right ears with courage, can have ripple effects that we might never know. Ripple effects whose fruits feed a multitude. Ripple effects where lives might be saved and we may never know. We may never see the role we play in this great story of God's. But one thing that the Bible tells us over and over again, including over and over again in the New Testament, is that when we act in love, God uses those things and God's kingdom begins to show itself a little more on earth as it is in heaven. This is one of the great callings of being a Christian, is to participate in the work of God, to help make God's kingdom come. Martin Luther King Jr. expressed that so beautifully in his I Have a Dream vision, which is really laying out for us in more modern words, what God's kingdom might look like here, a place where the content of one's character is what we see and not the color of their skin. Our acts of love, our acts of courage, our willingness to not let the words of God slip through our fingers will have repercussions far beyond what we can see. They're part of the big picture of God's kingdom coming to this earth. And they may be words that only you are given. So I guess what I'm inviting us to in this really difficult time is to have courage. Like Samuel, be willing to listen. You may need someone else to help you figure out whether the words that you're given to say are the words of God or the words of something else. 
test their fruits. See who they feed. See who's left hungry. See if they sound more like the Magnificat where the hungry are fed and the poor go empty away, which doesn't mean God doesn't love them. It's just a question of who's fed at that moment. Have courage. Don't let the words of God fall to the ground. It's hard to do, but you are an essential part of God's kingdom. And part of our role right now is to cast the vision of God's kingdom as clearly as we can so others can see their role in bringing it also. Amen. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in deepest sin, my hand will save. I, who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard. Yeah.
I am.